Revelation chapter 14 this morning called this message marked out for victory or marked for victory speaking of the 144,000 but not just looking at that time uh, that future time of these faithful witnesses but also gleaning this morning what we can learn by way of example through such an opportunity for us to look at their character and uh, their mission. And uh, much we can glean from that. I want to begin this morning just by reading this passage of Scripture, and then we'll ask the Lord to bless our time uh, through prayer. Revelation 14, verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his name and the name of his Father written on their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of loud thunder, and the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased from the earth. These are the ones who had not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. Praise the Lord for his word. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word. Oh Lord, we thank you that you desire to do a, a work in our midst this morning. And Father, even this morning as we look at Revelation and this passage, and we look at a time that is coming in the future, a time of great tribulation, a time of great distress, we worship and we honor you because you have raised up these faithful witnesses in the midst of all of that cultural difficulty, all of the tremendously difficult times, and yet these men remain faithful because, Father, you have protected them and you have provided for them and you've given them everything they need to carry out their mission. And Lord, we look to their example this morning for you have called us to a mission. You have given us great purpose and yet we face a culture hostile to the gospel Father, may not be as hostile, but nonetheless hostile. And we are to be reminded that you have given us everything we need for life and godliness, and you will persevere us in Christ because of the Lamb of God, because of the sacrifice of Christ. And so, Father, commission us this morning, Lord, Help us this morning grasp what it means to live in the last days and, and live in our day is ones that have been called out, marked out for your purpose. And so fill our hearts this morning, we pray in Christ's name, amen. As we look at the 144,000 this morning, and we read of the account of their ministry, and we read of the account of, of the celebration from heaven because of all that they have been able to do. We recognize that this started back in Revelation chapter 7. 
And we saw these 144,000, these Jewish believers, these men of God called from from all of the 12 tribes, very specifically, uh, literally given to us in chapter 7. And I'm not going to go back there and uh, talk about what we've already uh, unfolded there. But just to remind you and realize that there are, there are those that would look at this 144,000 and, and uh, try to give another explanation. But just using this morning of the, the, the explanation and found in the context of, of Revelation, literally what these 40, 144,000 are. And we're going to look at their description. We're going to look at their character. And we're going to be reminded uh, of what has been happening in the context as well. As we looked at verse 14, and this morning we look back and we're looking at verses 12 and 13 in the past, and this signals an unexpected and forceful contrast to what we have been looking at, especially in chapter 13, as, as we looked at Satan, as we looked at the dragon, as Satan, as we looked at the beast, the Antichrist, as we looked at that second beast, um, the, uh, the, the, the uh, false prophet. And, and so we see the, the imitation of Satan here. The influence and the culture and the tremendous difficulties that are being be brought on by these, this ancient war that's been going on. And we see the mark last week. The mark that was required. The mark that was given. The mark that was preached about by the false prophet. The mark that that symbolized the worship of the Antichrist and ultimately Satan. The mark of the beast. But all of this we have seen before that there have been all this time. The faithful. The opposition. And the 144,000 that have been marked out, not by the beast, but in contrast, have been marked out by God. Marked out by the Lamb of God. And so this whole chapter, chapter 14, is, is proliptic again. That is, it's looking towards a future time. It's looking at a snapshot of the behind the scenes of what's going on. On in the tribulation and what will occur at the very beginning of the millennial reign of Christ. And these features here of the, the lamb and the and 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 today and as we looked at before, the beast and the dragon and the false prophet all explain what's going on during this tribulation period and we get to revelation 14 and we're introduced again to what's been going on with these 144,000 and we've seen that this is these are men that God has raised up that is marked out that is consecrated uniquely and per, and supernaturally protected To carry out a preaching ministry that will reach the entire world. Indeed, there will be those that will be coming to Christ from every tongue and nation, every tribe, all peoples. And yet, in the midst of difficulty that no believer at any time has ever faced. This is... Un- unreal the amount of opposition because all the while the 144,000 are, are doing this preaching ministry this gospel ministry there, there, are, there is the, the, the dragon and the beast and the false prophet and they're waging raging war and they're using the nations And all of the culture and all of the things that are going on are aimed against the Lamb of God. And yet there are ones, those future day Daniel-like men of God. 
At the opening of Revelation 14, we're introduced to the most triumphant group of men the world will ever know. And Scripture describes them uh, faithful, godly, uncompromising, committed men like Daniel and Joseph and Paul. But never again, or never will be such a large group at one time. There never has been. But as I was looking at this and thinking about these, these 144,000 Daniel-like, uncompromising witnesses and preachers, I thought about another passage of Scripture. Turn in your Bibles, keep your finger there in Revelation, and turn over to Hebrews Hebrews chapter 11. Because God has always had his remnant before our time, in our time. And as we look at the 144,000, there will be those in the future time. In the future time. And God is always then using this kind of character and marking out men for his purpose. Look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32. And again, this whole chapter by faith, and it recounts all of these heroes of the faith. All of these men, just men, but did tremendous things because of their faith in the Lord and ministry unto the Lord. And we get to verse 32. And the author of Hebrews says this, And what more can we say? For time will fail me to tell, tell of Gideon and Barak and, and Samson and Jothiah and David and Samuel and the prophets who by faith conquered kingdoms, performed acts of righteousness, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched the power of fire, escaped the edge of the sword. From weakness they were made strong, becoming mighty in war, putting foreign armies to flight women receiving back their dead by resurrection others were tormented not accepting the release so that they may obtain a better resurrection and others experience mockings and scourgings and yes also chains and imprisonment they were stoned and sawed in two and they were tempered by they were put to death with the sword and they went about and sheep skins and goat skins being destitute, afflicted, ill-treated. And look at this. Verse 38. Men of whom the world was not worthy. Men of whom the world was not worthy. Wandering in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground. And God has always marked out the people of God, a remnant of God, the chosen of God, the marked out of God, not to be superhumans, not to be super saints, but to trust in a sovereign Savior who is able to establish them and keep them and protect them and equip them and lead them. This is exactly what has been uh, what is talked about in Revelation as we look at the character of the 144,000. One author put it this way, talking about the 144,000. He says, "No other age has produced a company like this, a variable army of militant believers marching unscathed through a form of danger that the world has never seen." And will not see until then. It has been theirs to, defile the, to defy the dragon, to bait the beast, and re, re, rebuke this false prophet. Their calling has been to preach the gospel from the housetops. When even the name of Christ called for the most dreadful penalties. They have walked the streets in broad daylight. In the midst of teeth-shattering rage of their would-be torturers and, uh, and assassins, these true witnesses of Jehovah experienced the most trouble 
error in all of history and of mankind. Jesus bears this out in the words of Matthew 24. This will be a, a time that will be the worst in history. It will be the most difficult in history. And yet God is able to save. God is able to accomplish that which he has given. <clears throat> and today we're going to look and we're going to study <clears throat> the marks Three marks of these 144 faithful witnesses to the Lamb of God. Who have been marked out with a calling. Who have been given the opportunity and the calling to, to preach and to teach the nations. To confront Satan. To confront the beast. To contradict the, the, the witness and the false theology of the false prophet. <coughs> And we'll do these things and we'll look at these things and know, yes, there is some very unique features of these 144,000 and we'll sort those out. But if we're very careful and we look at this text, we can see much here for our benefit, much here by way of example. Much like in Hebrews chapter 11, where we look back at these saints of old that endured and yet were able to stand faithful. That preached even while persecuted. Here we look forward. We look forward into this time of future tribulation wherein we, we have seen the, the unmitigated force of hostility. That is against them. The, the culture. <coughs> that is hostile against the gospel. We see all of these things. All of Satan's forces. He has put all, all the stops. He is putting in all his reserves. All of the demons. All of his minions. Are all standing and, and waging war with the lamb. And those who would stand faithful to the lamb. And yet these 144 Thousand men are uncompromised. What an example for us. What an example for us. We would do ourselves disrespect to the word of God if we saw these 144,000 as sort of superheroes. Because these are real men. These are real men. Yes, they've been called out and there are some unique features. But this morning as we look at those features, we're going to see that we have and we've been given a lot in common with them. And God spoke to the men of old, as Hebrews 11 said, and called them by faith. To do courageous things to, in the face of hostile culture, in the face of hostile leaders, in the face of, of death and persecution. He, he called the Old Testament saints to be faithful. He called the 144 in the face of the dragon and the beasts and the hostility of the great tribulation period to stand firm act like men and preach the gospel and dare I say there is a lot in common with what God has given them God has given us would we be the kind of men and women who would be the remnant in our own time? Who would not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Who would be ready and willing and able there to bear the cross, to pick up our cross and follow Christ wherever He may go, wherever He may lead us? Will we be the kind of church that will be faithful and stand in difficult times? In the midst of a culture that hates the gospel. In the midst of a culture who hates our Lord. In the midst of a, a movement 
and, and uh, philosophies of our day that are all aimed at declaring war on the glory of God and our Savior. The ancient war has been going on since the fall and will continue and culminate in the book of Revelation. And it is our time now. God has uniquely equipped us and He has given us everything we need pertaining to life and godliness to stand strong in our day and to declare His great mercies and to declare His great gospel and to cause people to, to glean and look at the cross and salvation. He's given us that faith once delivered the sound doctrine and sound theology. And he said, stand strong at these things. We're called to be in the likeness of Christ. We're, we're called to be those who would walk according to the principles of the kingdom that is yet to come. A would be one, a would be like the ones who fold because of worldly pressure, because of false religion, because it is the easy way, because it is, it is the broad way, because it is the, the path of least resistance, because it is the popular way. Or will we be like these men? So let's look this morning at these passage. And, and let's look at these three marks. These three marks. God marked these individuals out for his purposes. Number one, I wanted you to see in verse one of chapter 14. That God had, that these folks have been marked out by God's protection and God's divine providence. Indeed, they have been marked out by God's or Christ as Christ's possession. And that's their identity. That's our identity. Look at verse 1. And I looked. This is an, a good transition. It is a, a marked transition. It is in opposition of what has happened in, in, uh, verse, in chapter 12 and, and chapter 13, talking about the beast and the, and the, two, and the, the two beasts and, and the dragon. So this is a new vision. He, he doesn't want us to be discouraged. He wants us to look at these. Then I looked and behold, the Lamb standing on Mount Zion. And again, we look back in contrast to that of the beasts and, and that of the dragon who stood on the sand and stood on the earth. And here we have a picture of the Lamb of God. A future picture. It hasn't yet happened in the chronology of Revelation. This is proliptic of Jesus coming and standing on the earth, standing on Mount, Mount Zion, beginning the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Hey, he's standing on Mount Zion. By the way, there are times when Mount Zion describes heaven, and this isn't one of them, and most of the time, actually, it depicts the, the literal earthly Mount Zion, unless it says otherwise. Well, we could spend many, uh, there, lots of time talking about that. But let me reassure you, this is Jesus literally standing on Mount Zion and standing in his millennial reign, beginning his millennial reign. And, and we look at this prolifically. And with him is the 144,000. Those who have been divinely protected this whole time. They've been marked out at the beginning of the tribulation period to minister to every tongue and nation and tribe. And, and, and Satan has thrown everything he can at these to get them to compromise, to kill them, to persecute them, to, ass uh, to assassinate them. But here they stand, that they stand in victory with the Lamb standing in victory. And the 144,000 having his name. 
and the name of his father written on their foreheads. This is, again, that, that mark. That mark, they've been marked out by God. They've been marked out as his possession. They've been marked out and they have their identification in God. They have the protection and they are a part of, of God's divine providence for their lives and their ministries. And we saw this mark way back in Revelation 7. Revelation 7. They've been protected. The enemy will not be able to destroy or uh, defame their message. They've been able to carry out their, their, their ministry. Through the tribulation period, because of God's divine protection and providence, because they are uniquely God's. It's kind of interesting if you look at this mark, uh, because we, we always talk about the mark of the beast. We talked a little bit about it last week. Can I say Satan doesn't have any new ideas? He, he's always mimicking and try to counterfeit God's ideas. And that's what the mark of the beast is. It's a counterfeit. It's a counterfeit mark of God. And here we have the real mark of God. The mark of the Lamb. The mark, again, that indicates protection and providential care and provision. And, it, and identifies them as God's unique possession. And this scene, this wonderful scene in verse 1, is really the fulfillment of, of Psalm 2, verses 6 through 9. The Psalm 2 we've looked at before, verse 6, it says, As for me, I have installed my king upon Mount Zion, my holy mountain. And so it goes on to talk about how, again, according to the promise, Jesus will stand. The Lamb of God will stand on Mount Zion and He will rule and He will reign. And He rules and reigns as the absolute sovereign, the absolute King of kings and Lord of lords, the God of all gods. There's no imitation here. The opposition will be put down. And He has His followers. He has His children. He has His unique, protected Marked out family, these 144 that, that bear the, his name, that is the Lamb. The name of the Father written on their foreheads. What a wonderful, wonderful thing. And, and so as we, as we think about that in, in our own context, we understand that, that all believers everywhere have been given our God's unique possession. We are God's. Everything we have is His. He is, and we are His unique possession. We are the love gift. We could go to the Gospel of John if we had time. We are the love gift as the Father gives us to the Son and the Son gives to the Father. We are a unique possession of God. And we are divinely protected by His providential care, by the way. Some of us have thought, wow, it would be really nice if God would come back and, and come, come and say to us, listen, the opposition's not going to be able to touch you. You're basically bulletproof. I'm like, wow, that, that would be nice. That's sort of a unique feature of, of the 144,000. That they're not able to be destroyed. But, but here's the thing. When we start thinking through very carefully and very theologically about our own lives. Satan cannot take our life either. God knows the number of our days. And none of us are going to die prematurely. We will die according to God's providence. We will go to glory in, in his time. Not in Satan's time. And not in our time. We've been given such 
protection. Look at John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 37. This is the ramifications of, really is, the, 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 the wonderful doctrinal truth of the perseverance of the saints and the sovereignty of God. John chapter 6, verse 37. All that the Father gives to me, I <clears throat> will come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. That is, again, God giving to the Son, and the Son receiving. Verse 38, for I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me. All that he has given me, I will lose nothing, but raise it up on the last day. You understand what's going on there? God's children. Timeless principle. God's children are His children. They are love gift given to the Son. And the Son will receive them. And the Son will keep them. And the Son will shelter them. And the Son will shepherd them. And He will lose absolutely not one of them. Are you feeling a little bulletproof? You should. Turn a couple more pages over to John chapter 10. More on the, the perseverance of the saints. John chapter 10, verse 28 and 29. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. <sighs> Underline that. That's, that. that's not what the 144,000, I mean, that, that, it's a little different. The 144,000 physically live through the tribulation. But here, John is saying to all believers, about all believers, he says, I give eternal life to them, that is, God gives eternal life, or Christ gives eternal life to them, and they will never perish. Do you know something funny in the New Testament? It, it never describes a believer dying, it always says they went to sleep. Why? Because the real essence of death is separation from God. And you and I as believers and all believers everywhere will never ever experience that separation. And so they will never really in a definitive uh, exacting theological term, well, they will never perish. And get this. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Not the dragon, not the beast. Not a false prophet. They will not be snatched out of his hand. We say, wow, well, didn't you say we're not, living, we're, not, we're not living through the tribulation period? But I also said, <laughs> Satan is alive and well and active in our day. And not only that, we have many antichrists. We don't just have one. We have many predecessors and they're all over the place. And we have many, 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 many false prophets they're all over the place too but guess what none of that none of the legion of doom will ever be able to snatch them out of God's hand my father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of the father's hands that is wonderful 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 truth be of good courage Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, for I am confident, this is Paul talking about the entire church, I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. If time permitted, we could go to Romans 8. God is working out everything according to his plan. There is no plan B. There is no responsiveness to the angry hostility of the mob, Satan, the beast of the Antichrist. God doesn't have to shift gears. Well, I guess, geez, I guess uh, Satan did this, so we got to put it in low gear. Here's plan B. No. God's got it. And it's, he's got it because he's marked out his ones. His 144,000 
and here and now those who have called on the name of Christ by faith responded to the gospel and who are uniquely Christ's and the Father's are in his right hand and his sheep to which he is the great shepherd of. Are you marked out? Have you been marked out? Have you you been marked out by the Son of God? Have you applied the Lamb's blood to your own life and to your own heart? And do you bear the marks of redemption? Then be of good courage. Be of good courage. God has you in His powerful right hand. And no one, no hostility that the enemy can wage against you will ever snatch you out of his hand. It cannot be done. Number two. Number two. We've been marked out as his own possession for protection and providential ministry. But also, number two, will be marked out by the song of redemption. Look at verse two through three. I heard a voice from heaven, the sound of many waters, the sound of loud thunder, and the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders and the one... And no one could learn the song except the 144,000 who have been purchased from the earth. And so we have a, a song. This powerful, joyful song. It is, it is powerful. It's like many waters. If you've ever been to the ocean, when the surf is up, the crashing of the waves. It's a powerful sound that is just continually emanating and, 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 and covers the entire beach. And it is described as loud thunder. I love the Midwest. Came from California where it rained like twice a year. and We almost never got to see thunder. So I am still totally enamored with thunderstorms. You know, I get that little warning on my phone. It just means I need to be home and looking out my window. I love it. God's lighting up the sky with his sovereignty. And no one, I don't care who you are, can ignore it. My dog tries. He can't. This this sound, this voice, this music cannot be ignored. It is the sound of thunder. And the voice which I heard was like harpists playing their harps. There's repetitive in the Greek here three times about harps. You know what's fun about harps? We said this before. It actually shocked me. I learned something I hadn't learned in seminary going through Revelation Angels don't play harps. All the Looney Tune cartoons that I saw are wrong. Don't figure. The saints play the harps, but the harps are playing. The other thing that that we saw about harps is it's always connected with joy. This is a joyful new song. The song of redemption. And the, all of heaven is involved in listening to this song and it's echoing down into the picture of the Lamb of God there on earth standing with 144,000 and the 144,000 are learning this redemption song. And it says they're the only ones. That is, you have to be redeemed. You have to be redeemed to sing the new song. You have to be redeemed to appreciate and sing the song of redemption. And so this is 144,000 now marked out by the new song of redemption. The song of redemption. That is the song that you and I sing. We sing with our hearts all the time. We sing in church. And our songs are redemptive songs. 
Because it's what draws us together. It's what knits us together as a church. It's what, it's what our life is now all about. It has been redefined and put back together by the song of redemption. And the truths of redemption. We were bought. We were purchased by the blood of the Lamb. We were dead in our trespasses and sins. We were headed for a Christless, hellish eternity. And Christ called us to Himself. What a tremendous thing to be joyful about. And we're going to sing. And we're going to continue to sing. And all heaven is erupted with this song of redemption. Because this war is over. And the redeemed will always say so. And so the song of redemption goes out. Marked out by the song of redemption. No one can sing this song who isn't redeemed. And so it is. The underline there, 144,000. They're learning the songs that the saints are singing and they're playing their harps. This is a great, great song. And our, our lives would be filled with the song of, of, of redemption. Colossians calls us and instructs the church that, that we would always be uh, having the song on our hearts. The song of our hearts. We are to edify each other with this song, the redemption song, the new song. It's unlike any other song. It's unique because it sings of redemption. It sings of the blood of the Lamb. It sings of the truth of the, of the sovereignty of God and the salvation of the Lamb of God and the perseverance of the saints. This is that precious, precious song. Is your, song, is your heart, is your mind, is your life marked out by this song? Do you find yourself worshiping 24-7? Do each reminder of each day beckon you back to the song? Yeah, it's one thing to sing in the shower. It's another thing to sing all the time. And this is the sometimes inaudible song. That is just the joy that plays out like the song in our own hearts. Is it marked out? Have you been called out? And I wonder, and I think to myself, and this is presumption, the 144,000 going through the difficult times that they were enduring, the hostility and everything else marked out, and we're just thinking of the time in the future. When they get to see their Savior. When they get to see and hear that redemptive song. When they get to hear, well done thou good and faithful servant. When they get to in, enter into the heavenly chorus with all the other saints of old. The ones that have gone before us. And that song reminds them they need to keep going. Does songs, do Christian songs, does the song of redemption, is it your fuel? For perseverance. I think God has given the church music. For that purpose. For perseverance. We, we come to church. We, we need to sing. But Monday morning we need to sing. And Tuesday morning we need to sing. And, and you get my meaning. Well number three. They were not only marked out by the, the mark of perseverance and the, the, the mark of, of possession and, and the mark of this new redemptive song, but they were marked out by consecration. Look at the character of these. Look at the character of these. These 144,000 had an uncompromising character that was consecrated. And this is a consecration that is not Supposed to be uniquely theirs, but is to be ours as well. 
The difference is they didn't fail. We fail. But we've been given everything we need for life and godliness. We've been given the armor of God. We've been given the sword of the spirit. But sometimes we leave that stuff at home. Or church. So let us be mindful of that as we look at this consecration. This mark of consecration and character. Verse 4. And these are the ones who had not defiled with women. For they have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among the Lamb as first fruits of God to the Lamb. And no lie was found on their mouth. And they were blameless. The first mark of consecration there is sexual fidelity. Sexual fidelity. These are the ones who have not been defiled by women. Some have taken this to mean that they were single and never married. And therefore, we're never involved in, in, in uh, the uh, sex. But, but this here actually is talking about defilement. And then there's nothing wrong with the marriage, uh, sex within the confines of marriage. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 4 says, Merit, The marriage is to be held in high among all. The marriage bed is to be undefiled. Fornicators and adulterers God will judge. And that's exactly what's going on here. There's been no fornication. There's been no adultery. These men are one woman kind of men. They are one that their eyes have never drifted. That they've been singly devoted in that way. They were sexually faithful. They had sexual fidelity as a mark of their consecration. The second mark of their consecration there is single-minded loyalty. Single-minded loyalty. Look at this. For they had kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who uh, the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. This is the, the picture of, of loyalty, the dedication of discipleship. Where God asked them to go, they went. If, if, they, if they said, go into the fire, they went into the fire. If they said, go into the lion's den, they went into the lion's den. If they said, go into that wicked city, they went into the wicked city. They followed Christ wherever Christ would lead them. What a tremendous, tremendous thing. For us to be reminded that God has called us to follow Him, follow Christ wherever He may go, wherever He may instruct. John chapter 10 verse 27 again says, My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. That is a mark of a true believer. Not only the mark of the 144,000, but a mark of a true believer. We are consecra consecrated. Our direction is consecrated. We, we have one GPS, and that is Jesus Christ. We, we, we get on the phone of our life, and we pull up the Word of God as an app. And it says, what direction would you like to go? Jesus. Where is Jesus? Where is he going this morning? And that's where they went. Oh, is she going to go to Antichrist's headquarters and preach there? Okay, we're gone. We're there. Oh, we're going to go to Timbuktu in the jungle. We're going to go there. We're going to go to that wicked city. We'll go there. And they went wherever God had them to go. They followed the Lamb. John chapter 2 verse 6 the one who says he abides in him ought to himself walk after the same manner as he walked. This is not unique to the 144,000. It is to be our character as well. We, we are, our directions need to be consecrated as well. Marked out for God. Marked out for God. Well, the next mark of consecration is the redemptive intentionality. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits unto God and the little lamb. 
There, there was the walking knowledge. There was a consecrated knowledge that they had been purchased. They had been redeemed. And so that affected their purpose and their direction. They were not only single-mindedly loyal, they were redemptively intentional. That they knew amongst Israel and the revival of Israel, they were the first fruits. And there were going to be more fruits and they called Men and women from all nations and all areas to Christ. And last but not least, they were absolutely, uh, <clears throat> they had absolute integrity. Look at verse 5. And no lie, no lie was found in their mouths. They were blameless. And the word blameless there does not mean they were perfect. It just means there was nothing there for the opposition to put their hands on their life and pull their whole life and their whole ministry and their whole testimony and more importantly, the gospel message down. Their, their lives were handleless. There was nothing evil to grab hold of. And not only that, they had perfect integrity. They always told the truth. They were not like so many men peddling the gospel with propaganda. Try, trying to uh, make it sound appealing to men. They just told the truth. Hey, here's the plain unadulterated, un unscathed over, unslippery. This is, this is the gospel. And they were clear. And they did not lie. What a tremendous thing for us to follow in their example. Because we too have been marked out as believers. We're marked out for his possession and his protection. We're part of his divine Divine purpose. We've been marked down and been given that divine, that, that wonderful new song, that redemptive song. And, and our lives are to be consecrated all the more as the day draws near. We need to hone in. We need to be men and women of integrity. We need to be men and women of fidelity. We need to be men and women who are single-mindedly devoted and intentional about our message and about our mission. Turn over for a moment back to Hebrews I couldn't help but just read this and we'll close. Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Put this in the frame of your mind. I know this is mostly speaking of the Old Testament believers that have gone on. But what think of the 144 as those future men as we read this. Therefore... Since we have such a great cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every encompass, uh, encumbrance and the sin which so easily entangled us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame and sat down at the right hand of the Father, the throne of God. Consider him who has endured such hostility by sinners against himself so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Don't grow weary and lose heart. It's going to get worse. And when it gets worse, God and his sovereignty will protect us more. And his provision will be, will be more than adequate. And, and no one will take our life Apart from the will of God, we will not go home early. And Satan will not be able to destroy us if we are firmly placed in God's hand. So the question before you here again this morning is, are you in Christ? Have you been marked out as his possession, defined by his new song, and consecrated in your direction? Let's close in a word of prayer.
Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, for the encouragement we get from examples. Examples long ago and examples yet to come. And so, Father, help us to be the people of God that you've called us to be. May we be as uncompromising as Daniel. May we be as uncompromising as those who will endure. And some even given their lives as martyrs. And then those, those of the 144. Lord, may we gain much encouragement for them. Because you protected them. You provided for them. And Lord, you caused them to be victorious. You too have marked us out for victory. May we walk in it as we cling to the cross and to the Lamb of God. In your name we pray.